And even before getting started, also thank you, SCT, for a very kind invitation. It's good to be back, uh, and I'm really uh, happy to present you and talk to you about uh, how to build uh, data-driven cloud-based video delivery solutions by leveraging and using the advances in AI. My name is again Gabor Molnar. I work for a vendor independent system integrator and managed service provider based in the Netherlands. It's called Divital. Our job as Divital is to build, design, as well as operate video delivery solutions. So our business is pretty much to deal with video from taking the video from point A to point B. We have service provider customers, we have uh, broadcaster customers, and uh, we have customers in various domains in the industry. My job is pretty much to run AI and use AI to make the products and services what we offer more effective and efficient uh, on the marketplace. So whatever is coming from the science, I try to apply and use the science to pick technologies, pick vendors, and pick solutions to be used uh, by our services. So what Divital does overall is, is really consultancy. We don't really do products. We don't have products. We are going out to the market and pick technologies, pick vendors, pick products, and put together solutions. And uh, recently, as the data is getting more and more important uh, for any design or any operation of a solution, we are getting more and more into the field of uh, data science and artificial intelligence. And that's why, pretty much that's why I was hired, because my profession from the university is to deal with data science issues and uh, anything to do with machine learning and artificial intelligence. So what I will talk to uh, today is, is not content creation. It's not post-production. It's not aggregation. So. I'm not going to talk about how to use AI to generate metadata or no, uh, how to use AI to, uh, to do content creation. I'm going to focus mainly on the distribution from the point of a uh, service provider as we see it as a system integrator, as we see it as a managed service provider. And uh, just to put Divital into the perspective and the way as we view it, because again, we don't have uh, our own design, we don't use our own products. We we operate systems, we design systems, and uh, also deploy systems. I think this should be working. On the top, you have technology. So from a point of a system integrator or many service provider, we go and search, uh, search a new technologies which is out there, which uh, would allow the company, allow the solution of our customers to be fast, scalable, and automated. And then we apply these tools, we apply these vendors' technology to put together and to do an integrated end-to-end -end solution. Of course, there are end-to-end -end solutions in the market. Sometimes we just complement them. But the bottom line is that uh, our focus is first to seek for the technology, then seek for the integration. And then, as a managed service provider, we need to operate those. So from the point of AI, if I need to talk about AI, it's very simple. Again, I'm, I'm going uh, to give you the viewpoint of someone who is dealing with it. It's not a destination. It's really a tool for us to make our job today uh, better, easier, and faster. Three areas I picked as a subject of this presentation, which could be interesting to highlight, again, from the point of applied AI. One of the areas, what people call AI ops or AI powered operations, how to combine data, how to use the data to do better and more effici efficient operations. The second area is, okay, so not just uh, operations, but uh, what do you really need to have a better tool also to support operations? Because we could, be before you get into the operations, very often you need to do testing, you need to do system testing, you also need to do pre-staging. Then the other area where we are also using AI and trying to do more research and development is client testing, set-top bot testing, solution testing, because all the vendors are focusing on their own individual solution, and our job is to make sure that the end-to-end -end solution is solid. So moving to automation is one way, but sometimes even with uh, test automation, you need to rewrite a lot of scripts manually, which is taking time, taking manual resources, and it could be useful to use AI to implement codeless test automation. That's the second area I'm going to talk about. And the third one is something which I highlighted last year, and we made some progress, is how to make a video test lab in the cloud. Think about like an application lifecycle management lab where you have vendors technology coming in into a cloud-based environment, which could be served as a fundamental basis of offering testing services and offering better operational services over the platform. I will address these three topics with examples. 
when you look at AI-powered operation, or I would even say, when you look at any data science problem, it can be really put into a very simple steps. First, you collect the data. I mean, you need to clean the data and put the data into a data lake, but practically, you are trying to reach out and get and gather as many data as possible. Then you use certain AI tools, either you use custom tools or you use your own design specific algorithms to find insights into the data. And once you have the insights, then you either just use it for alerts or creating some decisions or making uh, proactive or predictive actions out from it. But that's a kind of a typical way to address any kind of a problem related to data. When it comes to video, let me give you one example which recently happened with one of our service provider uh, customers. We are doing many services for them and all of our monitoring tools was telling me that, telling us as, as a MMA service provider that service is good, all the uh, uh, monitors in the NOC were green, all the signals were green, but we, uh, we saw some problems that uh, were coming in and uh, some of the customers didn't, uh, didn't have the right way to look at the GUI from the service. Then we started to monitor the normal traffic. Uh, we started to monitor it per day of the week and per hour of the day. And this allowed us to do automatic anomaly detection. So if you look at the upper side, this is where we collected the data. This data is coming from the control plane. And through collecting the data, our engineers were able to use machine learning techniques and tools to make predictions. And what you see in the lower part, this is the prediction of the data. And through making and evaluating the differences between the prediction and the actual data, they were able to identify very fastly the root cause of the problem that the control plane traffic, a certain part of the control plane traffic, were blocked by the load balancer. So this is just a kind of a specific example, and you can have many, many examples. I'm sure that Alex or Dominic will also uh, show you many similar areas where you have a problem, it takes manual time, a lot of time to troubleshoot the problem. And AIs for us and for them as well is a tool to make sure that from the detection of the problem until the resolution, the time is shrinking. And then you go into not just the discovery, you also go into a more predictive analytics. Like, okay, so what happens if I don't just detect it, I want to prevent this happening? And then by the proper analysis of the data, you can also go and do prediction and prescription. So like, okay, if at this deployment rate the traffic continues, you will hit maximum capacity in three months. Then you need to really start planning for the expansion. This is the true value what data analysis could provide to you. And I'm curious how many in the room are engineers, if I may ask this question. Well, it's very, very good. How many of them are from a service provider? Okay, it's a bit less, but I mean, we are, or we have learned regression in school. So this is not really, I mean, data science or, or artificial intelligence and machine learning are not really new. I mean, most of the algorithms existed in the past. How we deal with it, it's a different subject, but uh, this is a way to, to address problems. The next one, again, using AI to do it, what we do anyway, in a more effi effi uh, efficient and effective way, is once uh, we are dealing with the problem or the actual challenge of having a new middleware release. If you do manu manual testing or even if you're doing semi-automated testing, then it can take several weeks, if not months, to be able to deploy a, a new middleware release on a field. So what happens if you apply robots? Well, you can do automation of the tests and you can also use AI to make sure that you can make the automation and the changes necessary to run those automated tests more effective and faster. Or the other scenario is that you're upgrading a DRM. You have a maintenance window and the service provider updates the DRM. And then if you're following a manual or a semi-automated path, then the complaints can start quite quickly. Something is wrong. Instead of doing that path, if you're doing it in an automated fashion, you can get to a stage where with full automation, you are able to fix the majority or find and identify the majority of the problems in a pre-deployment phase. And once we are moving into the CI-CD environment, one of the biggest problem, uh, what we see from the point of a system integrator or many service provider, that we are dealing with ecosystems. We are not dealing with fixed end-to-end -end solutions. We are really dealing with 
a lot of permutations of potential solutions. It's very difficult for a single vendor to test their product on an end-to-end -end fashion against any potential and possible configuration or permutation of the other vendor's products. So that's the third area, what I briefly talked about last year and we are progressing, is what we which would call an application lifecycle management lab. Think about a cloud-based, a fully cloud-based video lab where each vendor are putting their code into a repository. And then through this lab, by combining and building end-to-end -end video delivery ecosystems, then you can create various configurations for you on the fly, on demand for the duration of your need which is much more cost effective than doing it today in today's environment once a vendor needs to build a specific lab for, the, for their own testing or a service provider at least needs to maintain two different configurations, one for the testing and another one for the pre-staging. So we were thinking about, okay, if the technology and the industry is moving to the cloud, this would be a neat way to move away from the service provider, the problem, <coughs> and create a lab environment where you can create these configurations for you and service provider could take advantage of kind of testing as a service in the cloud as well as vendors could take uh, advantage of the service as testing in the cloud or even pre-staging in the cloud. So these are the three areas where we already see that AI can be useful and uh, in various stages that's what we are doing. But let me make one point which is also important. It needs to it needs to all come to a common understanding why we do that and how new, I would say, end-to-end -end services needs to be constructed because we have a lot of time are boiled down on a technology. And one of the important things which we are also learning once we are dealing with service providers and broadcasters as well, that many of the data, <coughs> what they have available are in different silos. So they have the marketing data, they have the IT data, they have data from various areas of the of their service, uh, content acquisition data, uh, delivery platform data, and these data, once we are talking about AI, it's not even an AI question, very often it is an organizational question to put all data into a common data lake, not to keep the data in silos. Because there are a lot of values of being able to predict capacity needs by looking at various stage of the uh, video delivery cycle. So connecting the dots in my mind would mean that if and when we are designing a network or a service, then the first thing we need to do is look at the data strategy. What is our main objective? What kind of a service uh, improvement or a KPI I need to meet and then design all the rest accordingly. And if, I, if you have any question, this is like a lecture, I wouldn't like to have just a broadcasting type of a discussion. Raise your hand and stop me that uh, uh, you'd like to have something to be clarified. And again, going back to the very basics, um, if you approach any issue, and I'd love to hear what Dominique and Alex will uh, tell you from their experience, it's the same kind of the structure of the problem. You are profiling a system, you, you, you see how it should operate. Then you really try to see what kind of animals you can detect by using, uh, using your, your, your tools. And then once you properly collect the data from the all possible sources, then you can plan your response accordingly. But, but what happens if you have supervised or unsupervised environment? What, what's, what's, what's the real value of a system integrator? What's the real value of the domain experience? Alex and I had a quick chat before this session and we were talking about, okay, my argument here is that if you have an unsupervised environment where you don't really have a training data, once you move into a situation to be able to detect, for example, a point anomaly, which is a simple way, it's an easy way to detect. I'll give you an example, maybe from, um, from fraud detection, using your credit cards. So if uh, someone is taking out cash from an ATM machine on a regular basis, taking out cash 90 euros, 110 euros, 75 euros, then if there is a single point of anomaly, and uh, trying to get 2,000 euros out, uh, then you can immediately realize, okay, that's a problem. But that's, a, that's an easy problem to fix because there is a point anomaly. What happens if you have a multivariate problem, you have a lot of variables, and the ranges of the data are okay? So you see a, a cash withdrawal of 75 euro, 95 euro, 85 euro, 
110 euro, and one of them was frauderless. And if you take it to a multi-dimensional environment, that's what we are facing with in many situations, that we know that there is a problem, we know that it needs to be uh, a model to be built using existing tools or algorithms, but what happens if the number of variables so large that even the best predictor will not build a good, uh, best tools will not build a good predictor? That means that the prediction will not be good, that means that the root cause analysis will be slow or not precise. So that's why I argue that the best experience from, from a domain expertise could be that they build the model according to the very specific need of the problem. And this is sometimes what we see that data scientists and uh, domain experts need to talk. You bring a department of data scientists, throw them into a problem, they don't always succeed because they have the best tools, but even applying the best tools not, doesn't always bring the best model. And you need to have a good model. And the, picking the good model requires domain expertise. Because, next slide, end customers, and that's the bottom line, they don't care about models, they don't care about data, they don't care about uh, anything else or the service provider offers, what they care about, quality. And our discussion with clients, service providers are, okay, so if you have a certain uh, percentage of your customers are possible churners, mainly they are focusing on the likely churners. It's about 12% data from PwC. And if you care, I can give you, give you the whole report uh, or link to the whole report after, uh, after the session. The service provider learned that they really need to care of their most of their customer base, legacy base, because after a couple of bad service experience, the possible churners will become churners. So building a good data strategy would allow a service provider to build a quality of an infrastructure in which problems cannot be just detected fast, but also prevented. And that's the bottom line from the point of operation. Putting it into a, a kind of a view set of a service strategy, Again, going back to customer care, getting the data, uh, video delivery platform, getting the data, core and access network, getting the data, in-home and uh, client endpoints. That, that's what uh, Dominique's company is doing very well, of, of displaying the necessary information um, uh, f uh, to the service providers. And uh, system integrators or managed service providers are using tools like their company's tools is to have it displayed. But also, from our point of view, many cases we need an involvement or building certain tools to have a better and faster prediction as well as prevention of certain domain-specific issues to happen. And that's what I think brings uh, managed operations and the quality of managed operations into a different level. Just to conclude, making sure that there are enough time for questions as well. Um, a few of the challenges I see from the point of R&D, and I leave it as a food for thought. Once we are comparing methods and methodologies, uh, there aren't really test data th sets which are working for the video operations. No accepted metrics to compare competing AI algorithms. Once we are advising clients to pick various tools, I mean, if you go around the show floor uh, trying to see various solutions, they all use AI. It's something like a buzzword today. They have to. I mean, that's something which the marketing people are doing. And they are rightly doing so, but how good an AR algorithm is in the operational domain, it's very difficult to research. It's a very, very complex area. We are not talking about one variable or not 10 variables. We are talking about thousands, if not 10,000 of variables to solve a specific problem. And then maybe one algorithm is good for fraud detection in the finance industry, when it takes care of uh, ATM withdrawals, but the same algorithm would fail to detect a very complex problem once you're concerning a video delivery uh, problem. The second is limited country or culture-specific training data sets. If you think about uh, um, speech-to-text, uh, AI can perfectly be used to have a conversion of the video content and then putting uh, uh, automatic subtitling. It is true that it's fairly correct for the US or the English language, but when it comes to, for example, to the Dutch language, I learned uh, through my discussion with broadcasters as well as uh, experts in the industry, there isn't many 
training data sets available. So that's something which is the challenge for the specific uh, countries that uh, it's not the AI algorithm that the lack of training data sets can create a challenge. The third one is for operational insights. You don't really have a good platform to share information. In the past, once engineers had run into troubles, then they just went on online and just uh, searched for similar-like solutions. Now, everyone realized that data is asset. We don't share data. We cannot really share data. That's okay. That's, that's valid. Uh, we don't want to violate GDPR. But for the insight point of view, there isn't a way to share operational insights. So here is where a good many service provider can also come to the uh, picture because our experience from the field didn't change after moving into the data world. In the past, we had an engineer to be dispatched to fix a problem. That engineer learned about it. Then he or she saw a similar problem at the next uh, dispatch. And then that was built into a uh, creation of a know-how. And the same is happening today, that uh, once we have insights, those insights can be shared and used elsewhere. But there isn't an automated way today to properly share operational insights with others. And it may sound a bit uh, old-fashioned, but in the field of automation, when everything is real-time, it is a problem. It is holding back uh, innovation. Another area what I see as an R&D challenge is there is no operator push for full automation. I mean, uh, people, especially the legacy vendors, rightly so, I'm not criticizing it, but the reality is that uh, uh, they are using legacy technology. Moving to the cloud is taking longer than expected. My argument is that uh, these kind of tools I presented, like the Cloud Video Test Lab, would be helping the industry to make more harmonized processes from the point of testing and would, would enable to remove some of the risk of cloud migration. This needs to happen. This will happen. It will need to happen step by step. But the speed as it's happening, I think it would benefit the entire industry to take it earlier than later. Okay, I talked about AI or lack of testing framework. Then the R&D challenge is how to create this testing framework, uh, which is both endorsed by the industry as well as the academia. If I put my academic hat on, I'm always having a problem to get data. Uh, companies are sitting in the data and uh, not really sharing information with the academics. On the other side, um, how do you deploy a transparent framework as a researcher or, or even as an industrial R&D person which is endorsed by the industry. So what are the best tools to use for a specific problem that still remains to be an R&D challenge? Or I can take it to a very specific level, again, coming from our field of operations, as simple as how to normalize log file information. For the very same technology, if you're using different vendors' products or services, you need to deal with log files. But those log files are very differently structured. So there, is, there isn't the harmonized uh, log file structure for uh, data collection, which means that in the data analytics process, most of the time, and it's very often even manual time, goes into cleaning up the data and harmonizing the data to be able to be analyzed by an AI module or an AI tool. Some kind of a log file normalization would also benefit the industry and the researchers, as well as uh, actually uh, engineers in the, in the domain of operations. And also, how to improve multivariate uh, anomaly detection when we have a lot of variables. Uh, it is simply, I mean, anomaly de detection is very simple if you have a single variable. It's more difficult if you have many variables uh, in a dimension of 10 or 100. But what happens if you have thousands or 10,000s? This is a level of complexity what we are dealing with in the field of operations. And uh, even the best uh, algorithms uh, needs to be used very, very carefully uh, to be able to use a, uh, or deliver a, a credible and usable result. And the, and the last one, which I just mentioned about the testing, how to accelerate cloud adoption. Our, our take on it is uh, really trying to move even the testing and the pre-staging to the cloud. But of course, there are other, other things to consider and other things also to, uh, to address this. With that said, that's what I wanted to kind of cover today. So again, starting from the point, I'm not giving you the point of a service provider, mainly giving the, you the points and viewpoints of a uh, managed service provider slash uh, vendor independent system integrator. We saw that AI for us is really a tool to improve what we do. We do it better, we do it faster, we do it more efficient. And I highlighted three areas 
One of them is the operation finding the root cause faster. The second one is uh, doing the testing more efficient. And the third one is to create a framework in which testing, pre-staging, and other activities can be done better. With that said, thank you very much for your attention, and I open for the floor for questions. Okay. Gaba, thank you for your uh, presentation. Um, sure, there are a lot of questions, not sure. Anybody any question for Gaba at the moment? No? Alexander. Yes, I was actually thinking every time one came up, he answers himself, so I really don't <laughs> have one either. Although I did have okay. two, but you answered them. Sorry. Okay, Dominic, do you have a question? Maybe from my side a question, if you could elaborate a bit on the efforts that, that are required basically uh, to go to automate to, to on autonomous testing in between preparation and then execution, because you need to prepare basically the training data, you need to evolve that maybe as well as you will learn more. Mm -hmm. uh, or, or, um, so there is some efforts required up front before you can fully kind of benefit your reduced test cycles and the improved coverage a, a in the setup. So can you size the preparation compared to basically the testing phase I, I, uh, so that people can get or maybe give us an idea on the overall gain uh, in basically the test cycle, then covering both preparation uh, and execution? Yes, that's an excellent question because that's one of the things which uh, might some, some hold back uh, some of the legacy uh, uh, people to move into that because the preparation today and the proper preparation for, for automate, fully automated testing is taking a bit time. It's, it's not as obvious as it seems. When it kicks in as a, as a benefit is once it's done and then you can do the cycles faster. So, but it, it also depends what you want to test. If you just want to test a simple application in a set-top box versus a set-top box or versus if you want to test two various uh, encoder vendors service, mm -hmm. these are all depend, but the type of a problem is you're spot on that for a properly designed automated testing procedure, you have a learning curve. You have a, some kind of a hurdle to, to, to pass, which sometimes may even prohibit you to think about that because, well, it's too much of a task. I don't have the right people. I don't necessarily have the right uh, investment to be made. I just do it in an old way. But if you think from the bottom or from the top line, it slows you down as a service provider. So if it's important for you to have a new release, if it's important to have a new feature to be deployed fast, then unfortunately this is a hurdle you have to take. No, I understand, and I think people just need to realize that this is not a recurring uh, effort, but that this, yeah. It's typically a, a, a larger uptime uh, thinking and design. It's an upfront uh, investment. And enough. this is when once typically once AI comes in, not in the preparation phase, but once, for example, you're testing a set-top box and you're testing a GUI in the set-top box, and uh, for example, the logo was moved uh, uh, 20 pixels left, which requires for you to manually uh, rewrite your script. However, if you have the right architecture and if you have the right scripting, then AI can rewrite this for you. So there is no need for a human involvement, but uh, you have to have the kind of the right setup to do these things. Thank you. Okay, good question. Can you give you, um, for just for me, I'm not very knowledgeable on this subject, you are. <laughs> give, you, give me some ballpark about um, when does it become uh, beneficial for the listeners to use AI or do it the old way? Is there a threshold? Is there... If you need to test one, it's obvious you do it the old way. Um, it, can you give some ballpark about some figures? It, it's, it's difficult to assess because the true answer is it depends. Yeah. It depends how large of a service provider are you. I mean, in, uh, this is, again, very small installation. Uh, we also deal with, with various kind of niche applications once the entire support uh, is being done by a part-time employee, mm -hmm. uh, like uh, maybe eight hours per week. Yeah then to deploy a fully automated monitoring solution just doesn't make sense. Yeah. And if you deal with a tier one operator who has a large uh, capital and labor tied into the process and they want to uh, really compete with other uh, alternatives on market, then it's, it's, it's not really a kind of a timing question. So it's, it really it depends. It's hard to say okay. on a specific number. But in your um, um, working together with providers, of course, you probably have some business tooling or case where you can answer the questions for the provider. Well, it's a no brain to use ours. AI testing versus use the students uh, eight hours a week. The way as it works, we get engaged and there is a client onboarding procedure for the problem. So we get them, uh, we, we go through a kind of a data strategy discussion and once we understand how important the data is for them, mm -hmm. how important to optimize their activities 
for the purpose of offering better quality of the service, mm -hmm. then we can guide them in the process of better automation. We can guide them for a more uh, lean and more automated operational procedures as well as better s testing which mm -hmm. supports it. But it's really the top down which comes, not the bottom up. Okay, thank you. If somebody else has a question, I think I have the last one. Um, I already learned that you used to speak about data warehouse, and I saw you mentioned the name data lake. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between a lake and a warehouse? Well, in my mind, lake is really a kind of a uh, place yeah. to put structured and unstructured data. So it's okay. just uh, put it uh, as a basket. I mean, anything goes practically. Yeah. And uh, then we can have another discussion, but it's, I don't want to take the time about <laughs> how uh, cost effective it is. Not, I mean, uh, I, I will sometimes have a debate with some of the engineers that uh, data storage is free. Um, well, if you really collect all the data and put it to the cloud, then you need to look at also the cost benefit of collecting every data versus collecting the relevant data. Okay. Uh, so, but the data lake you can consider as a basket for structured and unstructured okay. information. Okay. okay, learn something about a lake. Thank you, uh, Gabor, for your uh, presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs>